Vamos a invitar al escenario a Josh Seiden, él es diseñador y coach, trabaja con equipos para crear excelentes productos y servicios, es autor de Outcomes over Output, coautor de dos libros, Sense and Respond, de Harvard Business Publishing, and Lean UX de O'Reilly. Un aplauso para él. Thank you so much. It is so good to be here. I'm, I'm so, so very happy to be with you today. Um, are you having a good time? Are you having a good time? All right. That's more like it. The, the, I just want to say for a moment, I just want to say thank you so much to the organizers and the crew and the volunteers and... Um, to, the, to, to all of you for being here and, and making this a great experience. Um, this is my first time in uh, Medellin, uh, and um, I didn't know what to expect. When I got here, the, the organizers were very kind, and they, they put me in a, a, a lovely little hotel uh, called the, the Click Clack. And I, I walked into the hotel, and I don't know if you can see, but the lamp here, it's, it's a lens. And I thought, like, oh, they did that just for me because I'm a photographer, but I'm there. Um, I, was, I, was, I was excited to see that. I want to show you something else in my hotel room, uh, which is really cool. It's, um, it, it, we're going to go someplace here together. Uh, I, 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 there's, a, there's a whiteboard in the toilet. There's an interior designer who decided to put this whiteboard in the toilet. And there's a product designer who decided to make this kind of whiteboard. I'm getting ahead of myself. That's not what I'm here to talk about, okay? <laughs> um, uh, I, I'm here to talk about uh, some of the ideas in my, uh, my new book, uh, which is called Outcomes Over Output. Um, I wrote this book, I, I, I do a lot of work, so my background, I, I, I spent a lot of years doing design, and I spent a lot of years now, in, in the last 10 years, working with teams to help them uh, work more effectively in collaboration with each other. How do engineers and product people and content people and designers, how do they work together more effectively? And that, um, in that question, you spend a lot of time working with agile teams. And in the agile world, there's kind of a slogan. The slogan says, we want to work on outcomes, not output, right? Um, we, we want to focus on the results of our work, not on the stuff that we make. But for most people who work inside large companies, that's not how their managers expect them to work. For most people who work inside large, large companies, their managers might expect something more like this. Hello, Peter. What's happening? Uh, we have sort of a problem here. Yeah, you apparently didn't put one of the new cover sheets on your TPS reports. Oh, yeah. I'm sorry about that. I, I forgot. Mm, yeah. You see, we're putting the cover sheets on all TPS reports now before they go out. Did you see the memo about this? Yeah. Yeah, yeah, I have the memo right here. I just uh, forgot. But uh, it's not shipping out till tomorrow, so there's no problem. Yeah. If you could just go ahead and make sure you do that from now on, that would be great. Right. So, so most of our managers expect us to make an output, make a thing. Um, and. This scene, if you think it's funny, I think it's funny, 
It, it's funny because we have a suspicion. We, we have a suspicion that the TPS report or the cover sheet is essentially meaningless. The output is not important. What's important is the result that we're trying to generate. And one of the things that I've discovered in teams that are trying to work on outcomes is that one of the reasons that it's challenging is that we don't have a good definition of what an outcome is. We think of it as a result or a goal. We talk about it in very vague terms. And so what I want to do today, I want to start with a very precise definition of what an outcome is. So an outcome, an outcome is a change in human behavior that creates value. A change in human behavior that creates value. Um, let me tell you a story to uh, help you understand what I mean by this. Um, I'd like you to imagine, I don't know if you can imagine a story with snow in it, but <laughs> um, I'd like you to imagine that you work in, a, in, a, in the government of a small city in uh, the great United States uh, Commonwealth of Massachusetts. Um, and uh, one day your boss comes to you and uh, says, uh, Josh, in this story, you're all named Josh. Um, it, your boss comes to you and says, Josh, there's an intersection down at the mall, and it's very dangerous. And it's your job to go fix that intersection. I need you to make a safer intersection. And so you go down to the intersection, and you, you take a look at what's happening, and you see there's an arrow on the ground, and, uh, and it says right turn only. That's what that arrow means. And yet people are turning left. And it's a T-shaped intersection. Um, and in the US, you, it's a law that you have to stop at a T-shaped intersection, but nobody's stopping. And so you think about it for a minute, you go back to your boss, and you say, boss, I have a, a great plan, and um, uh, I'm gonna put up stop signs and no left turn signs, and that'll make the intersection safer. And um, your boss says to you, uh, Josh, you're, you're a genius. Um, it's my story. Um, <laughs> And, um, and so you do that. You work with the, the, the Department of Public Works, the, the, the city department whose job it is to put up stop signs, and you make these stop signs and these no left turn signs. And you're very proud of yourself and uh, you and the, the crew from the Department of Public Works, you put up the stop signs, you go out for beer, you high five. Um, the next day you go back to the intersection to see how it's going, and this is what you see. This is, this is Massachusetts. Um, <laughs> and, and, and so what's going on here? And I want to step back from this story for a moment and, and talk about, um, uh, talk, use a little bit more language uh, to talk about this. I want to share with you a framework that uh, if you work in the social impact sector, you're probably familiar with this framework. This framework is called the logic model. Um, and it gives us some language to talk about this story. Um, so the story starts all the way on the right when your boss comes to you and says, I want to create a safer street, okay? That's the highest level result, the long-term goal that you're seeking. That's what we call an impact. And in business, an impact are the things that the most senior executives care about. They're things like revenue and profit and customer loyalty and cost, right? These big things they're long-term, they're important, but they're also the result of many other factors, okay? So they're very high level. Um, it's often the case that, that the teams that are trying to be more outcome-oriented will start up there. The problem is it's too big a problem, right? It's too big a problem. And so the next thing that happened in the story is we went down to the other end. We came down here and we said, this is our plan. We're gonna need these resources, um, these, these people, we're going to do these activities, it's going to cost this much, it's going to take this much time, and at the end of it, we're going to have stop signs, the output, the stuff that we make. Um, the problem is we didn't create the outcome that we were seeking, the change in behavior that would have created value. The change in behavior would have been no left turns. 
it would have been stopping, okay? So the output were the signs. The outcome was the change in behavior that we did not achieve. Now, there's something important to talk about here, um, which is that there's nothing wrong with the output here, okay? We made perfect stop signs. They were on time. They were on budget. They met every requirement. They matched the specifications exactly, but they didn't do what we wanted them to do, which was create an outcome or change behavior. And so this is something that happens to all of us, I think, in our work, if you work in product development, is that you work on a feature, you ship some new product, and it doesn't do what you expect it to do. This is why teams are trying to be more outcome focused. Now at this point, you might be asking yourself another question. Why is he talking about this at an interaction design conference? And if you'll, if you'll indulge me as one of the uh, Interaction Design Association old timers, I want to talk for a couple of minutes. I just want to take a little, a, a little detour here uh, and talk a little bit about interaction design. Um, we've talked a lot about a lot of different kinds of design uh, over the last two days. We've talked about user experience design. Uh, we've talked about service design. Uh, we've talked about product design. All of those are good and important, and we use those methods in our work every day. But this is Interaction Latin America, hosted by the Interaction Design Association. So can we talk for a couple of minutes about interaction design? And, and because I have the clicker, the answer is yes, we can. <laughs> um, so... Uh, I, I'm one of the old timers in this group. I, I was around uh, in 2003 when, when the Interaction Design Association uh, was, re was just getting off the ground as a mailing list. And, and um, I'll take you a, give you a little bit of history of some of the things that we talked about. Um, in the early days, we had some pretty uninteresting conversations. Uh, we talked about things like, what do we call this stuff that we're doing? And um, we spent a lot of time talking about that, probably too much time talking about it. But we decided we were going to call it interaction design, and we were going to abbreviate it this way. Um, in, um, but then we got down to some more interesting conversations, which is what's, what's interesting and different and special about interaction design? How is interaction design in some way different from interface design? or usability, or human factors, or all of the other important disciplines that were out there. And, and we asked the question, what do we make? Which, because we were trying to figure out, like, what is the thing that interaction designers make? What do we work with? Do we just, are we just the people who make the wireframes? Like, that can't be special. And in 2009, at our second global conference, um, we heard from uh, Robert Fabricant. And Robert Fabricant uh, gave us a keynote address, and he said, behavior is our medium. That's the special thing about interaction design. This is what we work with. We design behavior. And everybody in the room, it was a room about this size, everybody in the room sort of nodded and said, yeah, yeah. I liked it too, but it left me with a question. Well, I got to go back to the office on Monday. Well, how the heck do I do that, right? Um, and, and we struggled with that for a couple of years, I think. Until 2011, um, at our conference in, um, in uh, Boulder, we heard from, uh, from Dick Buchanan. And Dick Buchanan gave a wonderful keynote. Um, and he, he said, look, let's talk about what an interaction is. So what is this interaction stuff that we're designing? And he said, 
that an interaction is how people relate to other people through the mediating influence of products. How people relate to other people through the mediating influence of products. And as a designer, that gave me something I could use. Because I wasn't designing behavior. I was designing products that changed the way people relate to each other, that changed their behavior. And you know, the organizers of this conference are actually pretty clever interaction designers. Um, this, is, uh, this is people relating to other people through the mediating influence of products. This is a valuable behavior. By the way, if, if you're in this video, uh, uh, find me tomorrow and I'll give you a free copy of my book, okay? <laughs> um, thank you for letting me do that. You, I know you didn't let me, I just did it. Um, <laughs> uh, these are people relating to other people through the mediating influence of a product. In that case, this, this thing here. Um, here's another one. You too, by the way. This is, this is a product that's creating a behavior, people interacting with each other on this wall. Here's another one, the signage out front. How many of you took a selfie out here with some friends in front of these signs? Oh, come on. <laughs> right? These are like you can't resist standing at these and taking a picture. These are people relating to other people through the mediating influence of products. So here's the thing. Products create behavior, okay? Products create behavior. Behavior is what we work in. And an outcome is a change in human behavior that creates value, okay? So this is why I'm talking about this at an interaction conference. I'm talking about this because creating outcomes and thinking about outcomes in terms of changing behavior is at the very center of interaction design. It's at the core of what we do. And so whether we are product designers or whether we are interior designers or whether we're designing a conference, right? We can call ourselves a user experience designer or an interior designer. We're using methods from interaction design. That's why I'm talking about that here. But that's not why you should use outcomes, okay? You should use outcomes for a different reason. In the old days, when we made stuff like this, I, I, I'm an old timer, but I'm not that much of an old timer. Um, when we made stuff like, like cars, right, we focused on the output. This picture is from a, a Chevrolet factory in California and down at the bottom, I don't know if you can see it, but it says one day's output at the Chevy factory. We knew what we needed to do to finish our work. We had a, someone worked on the tire and someone worked on the wheel and someone worked on the axle and someone worked on the chassis. And we put it all together and we had a car and we were finished. Easy. Um, but, but our problems today and the products that we work on are not like that, right? We heard yesterday uh, about wicked problems, right? And increasingly, these are the kinds of domains that we're working in. Um, they're, they're products where it's hard for us to predict what people will do with them. This is, any of you know the story of the hashtag, right? The, when, when Twitter uh, was first uh, around 2007, there were no hashtags in the system. In fact, it was a user who invented the hashtag. He sent a message that said, let's track our conversations by using this pound symbol. And it wasn't until two years later that Twitter added official support for the hashtag. In fact, most of the stuff that we think of as kind of core Twitter functionality emerged the same way. Um, people would retweets and at replies. People would just start doing this, and Twitter would sort of see that it was valuable, and they would add official support for, the, for that feature 
into the product. And these kinds of complex systems that we're building where people are in, interacting with one another in, in this sort of unpredictable way, I think this is what's led to the emergence of these kinds of cyclical product, uh, cyclical, cyclical process models, right? This is, this is what I, I call in, in my book uh, the sense and respond loop, but it's the agile loop. It's, the, it's any kind of iterative loop where we make a thing, we ship it, we put it in the world, we sense, is it working, is it not? What's the effect it's having? And then we respond based on what we learn, right? That's what it, Twitter was doing when it was adding the hashtag. So it's hard for us to predict what people will do with our products. It's also hard to predict what effect our products will have in the world. Um, I have a friend who lives in Australia who came to visit me in Brooklyn recently with her two teenage sons. Um, I live in, in Brooklyn in a, a neighborhood that's about 20 minutes away from a neighborhood called Dumbo. And um, uh, my friends on a Saturday morning wanted to meet me and they said, could we meet in Dumbo? Um, uh, my friend said my, that my son wants to meet in Dumbo. Now, I don't usually go to this neighborhood on the weekend, but I said, okay, sure, fine. I walked over there. And when I got there, it was filled with people taking selfies. It was crazy. They were all standing around this one intersection taking selfies. And my friends wanted me to take their picture there too. And I asked them, you know, why, why are we at this intersection? And why is everybody else at this intersection? And the, the, the oldest son said, Instagram. Um, and it turns out if you Google Brooklyn Dumbo Instagram, everybody's taking the same picture. Um, it turns out that this has become kind of a big problem. This is a, this is a poster from um, Jackson Hole, Wyoming. This is another destination in the United States. It's a beautiful uh, wilderness area in the, in the mountains in the west of the country. And uh, you can see they have this ad campaign, one little tag, one big problem. Let me, let me show you what this is about. Over one billion people use Instagram daily and many of them live for the pursuit of an epic photo. But chasing likes comes with a price when it puts a spotlight on a secluded nature area. Because every time someone captures stunning scenery and tags the exact location, crowds follow. And the traffic causes unintended harm to pristine environments, plants, and animal habitats. Here in Jackson Hole, Wyoming, we have two national parks at our doorstep. So we see this problem playing out every day. Which is why, in the spirit of our conservation tradition, we're championing a new environmental initiative. Tag responsibly, keep Jackson Hole wild. It's pretty simple. When you're ready to share a photo of one of the many breathtaking areas of our vast wild, we ask that you skip the specific location tag. Instead, share your photo using our generic location tag. Tag responsibly, keep Jackson Hole wild. In doing so, You'll help preserve our natural treasures for generations to come and help encourage a behavior that can impact wild spaces everywhere. Tag responsibly. Keep Jackson Hole wild. Yeah. So, so we're trying to, did you, I don't know if you caught that in the very end of that video, we're trying to encourage behavior, right? That's what that campaign is designed to do. Now, is it going to work? I don't know. Do you, do you know? No, I don't know. Um, but that's the point, right? That's why we need these kinds of processes where we try something and we see if it works. And if it does, we double down. And if not, uh, we try something else. And so when we're working in these complex systems, right, our focus, the focus of our work really needs to be about the outcome, right? Not, it's not about the stop sign. It's not about the thing we make about the result that that thing has in the world. All right, fine. Now what? How do we do that? How do we work with outcomes? The first question that most teams ask me when we start down this journey is, how do I find the outcomes that are important um, that we want to create? How do I find the important outcomes? And so for that, I like this notion of, this, of the idea of a magic question. 
And I think to find outcomes, there are three magic questions that we can ask. The first magic question, what are the behaviors that create value? The second, how can we get people to do more of those behaviors? And the third is how do we know we're right? This is a good one to tweet, he said, encouraging your behavior. Um, I'm going to show you an example of, of you, how, we, or how, how I've used these magic questions in my work. Uh, I'm going to tell you a story about an organization that I worked with in, in New York City. Uh, this is a nonprofit organization called Taproot Foundation. And um, Taproot Foundation does a lot of things, but one of the services, the kind of core service that they offer, is that they help nonprofit organizations who can't necessarily afford professional services, they help them find professional consultants who are willing to volunteer their time. So maybe you need a marketing plan or a human resources plan, or you need to figure out something with your financial planning, right? Taproot will help your nonprofit find skilled volunteers who can help you. And then they will work with those organizations and those volunteers to deliver a, a three-month or a six-month consulting engagement to do that work. And so the team at Taproot that I was working with gave me a call, and they said, look, hey, Josh, we've been given um, a, a strategic goal for next year, and uh, we have no idea how to, how to make headway on this, and can we, can we work on that? And so the strategic goal um, was to increase the net promoter score of the service. Um, I'm not going to talk about net promoter score. <laughs> not really. But if you don't know what it is, um, it's, just a, it's, a, it's a measure that is intended to, to, to understand whether customers would recommend your product to other people. Just, we'll leave it there. Um, so, so, the, so, so this team at Taproot came to me and they said, look, our bosses have come to us and they say, we have to increase the net promoter score of our service, okay? And um, they're asking us to plan the next year's worth of work. It was November, it's about this time of year. And they said, we just don't know what we should do, right? We need to give them an annual plan, but we don't know what we should do. And so at this point, we sat down and we used the first magic question. And that first magic question is, what are the changes in behavior that will drive these results for your business, okay? What are the changes in behavior that will predict a higher net promoter score, a more satisfied customer, okay? Well, to understand what behaviors we need to change, we had to understand what the behaviors are today. What are people doing in the course of these consulting engagements? And so we took a method from service design and we created a, 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 essentially a, a three-swim lane service map, right? a service journey. And we said, what are all the different things that people do as they go through the project? At the top, we said, what are the nonprofit uh, organizations do as they go through the, the, the uh, project? In the middle, we said, what, what are the things that the Taproot team is doing? And at the bottom, we said, what are the volunteers doing? Okay. And then once we had kind of all the behaviors mapped out, we, we went back through the map and we said, what are the behaviors that predict a good result? What are the behaviors that predict satisfied customers? We then took another pass and we said, what are the bad behaviors? What are the behaviors that predict people will be unhappy? So for example, we learned, not rocket science, when people answer their email, okay, things go better. Customers are happier. People answer their email promptly. We learned that when people show up at meetings face to face, when people meet each other in person at the beginning of the project. So simple behaviors. What are the behaviors that predict people will be happy? And then we went through and we prioritized those behaviors. Which ones were the ones that we thought would be most uh, effective to work on? And we created a prioritized list. It was a little more complicated than what I'm showing you on this slide, but it was basically this, right? We said, you know, 
If people respond to email faster, good things happen. Let's work on that. If people meet each other face to face, good things happen. Let's work on that. And so on and so forth. And so we now have another layer in our map. We know that our, the impact we're seeking is, is to increase net promoter score. And the outcomes that we want to create over the next year, that's our prioritized list of work. Okay. So the next question, magic question number two, how do we get people to do more of these things? How do we get people to do more of the good stuff? And how do we get them to stop doing the bad stuff? Okay. That's where we start to turn to, okay, what is the output we're going to make to create those new behaviors? Now, here's the thing. We still didn't know, right? We still didn't know. And that's what they were trying to figure out. We still didn't know. And I said to the team, listen, that's a good thing. It's good that we don't know. Because this is November, and if we're planning work for the next year, and we know in detail everything that we're going to make and build and do over the next year, we're either lying to ourselves or we're lying to our stakeholders, right? We don't know yet what combination of things will create the result that we want. Should we make a new feature? We want people to respond to email more quickly. What should we do? Maybe every time an email is sent, we should bug them with an autoresponder. That might work. They might kill us. Maybe we should create a new service. Every time an email is sent, we pick up the phone and we call and we say, answer the email. Right? Maybe there should be a policy. Right? If you don't respond to your email in 24 hours, you're off the project. Or maybe it should be an ad campaign like the people in Jackson Hole. Right? We don't know, but these are the tools at our disposal. We do not yet know which ones are going to be effective. And so to try and figure out which ones are going to actually work, that's where we get to magic question number three, which is how do we know we're right? And at this point in the planning process, the best thing that we can do is express our intention as a testable hypothesis. We think we can achieve this outcome if we can help these users do this new behavior with this feature or policy or service. And then we can figure out how we're going to test our idea. And we can start that process of testing our idea continuously. Okay? So that's how we find and use outcomes with the magic questions. We say, what are the behaviors that create value? Those are the outcomes that we're seeking. How can we get people to do more of those behaviors? Those are the features and outputs that we're planning. And how do we know we're right? Those are the tests and the metrics, the MVPs, if you will, uh, that we're planning. Now, in all of this, we've been talking about creating value for uh, Taproot Foundation. We've been talking about value from the business's point of view. But we're here doing user experience design. We do user research, right? So are we trying to create value for the business, or are we trying to create value for users? Well, that's the thing. Outcomes actually have a point of view, okay? So let's talk about this for a second. Um, for a business, I want you to imagine now a business that, how many of you here uh, traveled uh, um, on an airplane to get here? Okay, how many of you are going to submit an expense report when you get back to the office? Yeah, okay. So. I want you to imagine uh, now that we're thinking about a company that makes and sells expense reporting software, okay? For a business that creates expense reporting software, they have a point of view about value. For them, value is customers will subscribe to our product, customers will adopt the features that we push out in the world, and customers will stay loyal to us. Customer churn is reduced. 
These are the behaviors. These are the things that customers do that create value for the company. But these things don't create value for the customer. The customer is doing them, but they don't create value for the customer. So what creates value for the customer? Well, there's somebody at your company who chose to buy that expense tracking software. Maybe you curse his or her name, right? Um, but, but for the customer, what are they buying? What's the value that they want? They want to enable certain behaviors in the accounting department. They want the accounting department to be able to track travel expenses accurately and to pay them promptly. And they want to avoid paying non-reimbursable expenses, like that extra shot of tequila you had last night. Right? So that's what the customer, that's the value that this product creates for the customer. It enables these valuable behaviors inside the company. But for all of you, you are users, right? The behavior that creates value for you is that it takes you very little time to submit your expense reports. And you get paid quickly, right? You don't care about customer churn for the business or tracking non-reimbursable expenses. You just want to get in, put your expenses in, and get paid quickly, right? So an outcome is a change in human behavior that creates value. Who do we pick? Is it user value? Is it customer value? Is it business value? What we're trying to do is we're trying to create a system that aligns the value delivery that says, if we deliver this value to the user, that will create value for the customer. And that, in turn, will create value for the business. That's what we're trying to do. That's the tricky part of what we're doing, is that we don't have the luxury of just focusing on user value. And we, don't have, and, and we have a responsibility to say to our, uh, our uh, employers, we can't just focus on business value, right? We're trying to create these aligned systems of value. Now, this gets more complicated as our examples get more complex and you have more participants in the system. Um, I think we're gonna hear a talk tomorrow morning about dealing with some of these complexities as our systems grow more complex. I'm not gonna talk about that today, but you know, it, 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 it's nice when our systems are only trying to align three stakeholders. All right, how do we organize? The next thing I want to talk about is uh, how do we organize our companies around outcomes? Because many of our companies, once we start to get into groups uh, that are uh, multi-team organizations, we tend to see companies and product organizations that get organized, oh, well, you are the tire people, and you are the wheel people, you are the axle people, and you are the people that put it all together. We tend to organize our product teams around the stuff that we make. Is it possible to organize our teams around systems of outcomes? So I want to talk to you about another organization that I had the, the pleasure of working with. This is a, the team at uh, hbr.org. Um, now, if you're not familiar with hbr.org, uh, that is the website of the Harvard Business Review. And um, that team uh, is responsible for, um, for all, of the act all, of, all of the operations, design, and building uh, of hbr.org. Um, when I met them, they had just gone through a transformation. They were organized functionally. They had a, a wheel team and a tire team. They had a, a homepage team. They had a checkout page team. They had teams that were organized around the website real estate. And they were getting requests from their stakeholders. Give me a button. Change this copy change the way this thing flows. All of their requests were coming in from their stakeholders as requests for output. Now, that would, alone wasn't enough to cause them to rethink what they were doing. What did cause them to rethink what they were doing is they, they had a backlog of feature requests 
that was over two years long. Two years. They had feature requests that were two years old that they'd never gotten to. And they had no way of assessing what should we work on next? What's more valuable? Should we work on this one or this one or this one? And how does that correlate to delivering value to the business? And so they took a step back and they said, we need to, we need to think about the value that we are delivering to our business. And they said, there's basically two big outcomes that we are trying to create. The first outcome that we're trying to create is we're trying to get people to buy stuff on our website. Right? We're trying to get people to buy subscriptions, magazines, books, white papers, training. We're trying to get people to buy stuff from us. And then we're trying to get people to consume more of our content. Right? And, and what they identified was that the more people consumed the content, the more value they got from it, the more willing they were to buy stuff, right? the more likely they were to consume the stuff that they purchased, and so on and so on. It was a, it was a cycle that was self-reinforcing and virtuous. And so they created two teams, one team that was all about working on getting people to buy stuff, making that easy, and the other team that was all about helping people consume stuff. Now, to be fair, there was a third team that was not about outcomes. This was a business as usual team. They knew what they needed to do. They just needed to run the site. They weren't testing or figuring things out. They were just keeping the wheels on and the site up and running. And so sometimes when I talk about this, people think that I'm saying everything is an outcome. It's not true. Some kinds of work are really, really well suited to outcomes. Work where we don't know what the answer is. When we know the answer, we just make it, right? And so the site operations team was all about that. We know the answer, we just need to make this stuff. Okay, so they created three teams, buy team, consume team, ops team. And then they started meeting with stakeholders and they said, look, <laughs> We know we have this two-year-old list here. We're not going to do any of that. <laughs> We're throwing that whole thing away. Talk to us. What are you trying to achieve this quarter? What are your business objectives for the quarter? And it turns out that this was actually a really, really difficult conversation because the stakeholders were not used to thinking this way. They were used to thinking about buttons and page flows, and copy. They were used to thinking about the outputs. And so the team really struggled with this. And um, they, they struggled with this, and they tried some of this magic question stuff. You know, what are the customer behaviors that will predict results? That didn't work either. The question wasn't very magic. Because nobody was used to thinking that way. So they tried a third thing, which is, Tell me what you're worried about. Just let's sit down with stakeholders and let's have a basic, simple human conversation about the business. No jargon. Tell me what you're worried about. And that unlocked the kind of valuable conversations that let the stakeholders and the design teams, the product teams, work together to figure out what those outcomes needed to be. We're worried, about, uh, we're worried about the sales funnel. We think it's too complicated. Okay, how can we work on the sales funnel? How can we simplify uh, the sales funnel? What would be the outcome if we fix the sales, um, if we fix the sales funnel? What new behaviors will people be able to do? What new outcomes will we create? So by taking it out of some of the kind of fancy specialized designer language that I telling you all about, and just having that human conversation, tell me what you're worried about, they were able to then redirect that conversation to outcomes. And, and having had those conversations then, their process became relatively straightforward. They talked about the key customer behaviors they were trying to create. They created their roadmap for the quarter, right? These are the outcomes that we are trying to create for the quarter. These are the experiments we're going to run. And these then, those experiments, get expressed as stories 
in their Agile backlog. Then they built stuff. They, made, they, they worked on the stories uh, in the service of those experiments. And then they watched what happened. Did it change the results? Right? Did we change customer behavior? Sense, learn, uh, adjust, uh, and repeat. Right? So that becomes the process for going from that conversation about what are you worried about to being more rigorous about focusing your work around outcomes. The interesting thing then is that it let that team kind of reconceptualize what a product is. Um, I, I had this interesting conversation with the head of technology there. He told me, he said, listen, I've worked in technology in media companies for 25 years, and I've never understood what a product is. Is the homepage a product? Is the website a product? But organizing around outcomes, I understood that this is a huge light bulb, that a product is a system to create outcomes. Products create behaviors. And so by focusing on outcomes, we focus on making that measurable change in behavior. It's not just products, it's services, it's content, it's whatever we're working on, right? We can look at through that interaction design level. <laughs> Thank you very much. I think we have time for a couple of questions. Yeah? Uh, there's one in the back of the room, and then I'll, I'll get to you, Seamus, okay? We have one there? I'll get to you second, okay? Uh, thanks, Josh. Great talk. Just a quick question. Um, in, in terms of, uh, I suppose, the, the response bit, um, and just looking at change and behavioral change, um, how long does that take? Is that like a cyclical thing? How many, how many, I guess, iterations are you looking at, and how long does the company, I guess, monitor it for? Yeah. Yeah, th thank you for that question. Um, the, the question was, in terms of responding and trying to understand outcomes, how long does that take, right? One of the things that we like about Agile is it's done every two weeks, right? The thing about outcomes is it's done when it's done. And that's, that's one of the things that makes it hard is that it's unpredictable when we will achieve the result that we're seeking. And so you have to build into your process enough time to get through a number of iterations and to get through some tests. One of the ways to do that is to set the, the HBR team, what they did was they would work on a single outcome for 12 weeks. And so they would try to ship multiple versions and, and see what emerged. And there was a tension there. They, they often felt like they wanted to go longer, but that it wasn't responsible to just focus on one outcome for, you know, uh, a long time. So th there's a bit of an art there is the answer. Okay. Yeah. Can you hear me now? Yes. Okay. <laughs> and it's about the cycle. You said you sense, then you learn, then adjust, then repeat. Yeah. And I, with that, uh, why can't you start with learning and then thing else and, and sense at the end and, and, you know, do the whole cycle, but start with learning. Yeah. Yeah. So the question is, why can't you start with learning? Uh, you can start with learning, right? Okay. There's, there's no reason in the world why uh, you have to start in some particular place in the, in the loop. And in fact, the, the, the loop is a nice, easy thing to draw, but it's just a really simple model of reality, right? Yeah, yeah because it's, it's sounds to me a little bit reactive 
if we start by sensing, and I, I would like to be as more proactive if possible. So here's the thing, I agree with you, it feels reactive to say, wait a minute, we ship, but then we learn? Shouldn't we learn and then we ship? What's really interesting, and I've had this experience many times in my career, as a designer, I want to study the problem, figure out an answer, and then make a thing. That's what I do, that's how I'm oriented. I work with lots of technologists who want to make a thing and then see what happens. And there's actually a really, really healthy tension there, right? Neither approach is exactly 100% right, and both approaches work depending on the context. So what you want to do is just acknowledge, right? What's the, you, you want to ask the question, what's the fastest thing we can do to learn? And sometimes the fastest thing we can do to learn is to just go talk to people. We're going to spend the day talking to other humans, right? We're not going to make anything. We're just going to talk to people. Sometimes the fastest thing to do to learn is to make something and put it out in the world, right? And so it really depends on context, but there's no magic about where you start. You start, you use your judgment about the right place to start. Yep. Oh, look here. There's one here in front. Just kidding. So yeah. Is there one in the back? Yeah. Uh, how, how do you predict failures when you are projecting a behavior? Um, like you, you design something to, to a behavior and people misuse the thing you are projecting? Yeah. How do you predict that? Um, well, you don't always do it. We haven't done a very good job of doing that as an industry. Um, the, the, the Instagram story, I think, is a good example of that. The, uh, the, the, the situation we find ourselves in with our social networks, um, uh, I think, is a, as an example of that. I think we're starting to, to ask those questions in a more systematic way in this industry. Um, sometimes it's framed in terms of ethics. Um, I saw a wonderful tweet uh, from my friend, um, a, a tweet of, my, of, of a talk um, uh, at a conference yesterday from, from Gretchen Anderson, who was talking, who said, we have to think about not just use cases, but abuse cases. I love that. And I think tomorrow we're going to hear from, from, I think Cheryl's talk tomorrow is going to deal a lot with that, about thinking out, gaming out the possibilities and trying to be prepared um, for uh, the unintended, unintended consequences of the systems that we design. Do we have time for one more? One more, or is that it? Thank you all very much. It's great to be here.